The clinical implications of methylation are fairly far-reaching. If you look at um, particularly the, the concerns that we see in the United States with health, cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, the growing concerns of depression, and then the imposing Alzheimer's epidemic. All of those conditions, among many other ones, have underpinnings in the methylation cycle, not just with the um, conversion of the folic acid pathway down to methyl tetrahydrofolate, but downstream effects and other activities in that pathway drive some of those concerns. Moderation is very, very important, so if you are trying to adjust somebody's methylated support, it's good to start slow and it's, it's good to slowly increase and, and instruct your patients or clients to really be able to give you feedback as to how they feel. Because for many of them, particularly if they're expressing uh, mood issues, they're gonna be able to actually feel it in most cases, or at least in some cases, whereas a lot of times you're taking fish oil or vitamin D, you don't necessarily feel it. Uh, so I think moderation is important. And the other part of it is, it's, you don't just give it, fill the tank, and then let it run out. So it's something that you slowly fill the tank, you go slow, and then you really probably need to support it long term. When you look at cognitive function and mood, depression, we know that um, the MTHFR 1298C, that particular SNP seems to have a implication in the production of neurotransmitters more so than the MTHFR six, C677, and, um, and then its interrelationship with co-methyltransferase enzyme, and then the MAO enzyme, MAOA and MAOB. So when you look at methylation, whether you're looking just at the MTHFR SNPs or you're looking at co-methyltransferase, all of those cofactors, so methylated folate, hydroxy B12, methyl B12, the production of SAMI, B2, all of them play a role in the production of those neurotransmitters. When you convert homocysteine down, so we make methionine, homocysteine, the next pathway down from that is CBS. So CBS is the start of transsulfation. So that's, that's where we start to move all of our sulfur groups and, and start detoxifying them. In those that are upregulated for CBS, so that enzyme runs quickly, um, what happens is, is they make homocysteine and they rapidly turn it over. So they're never gonna have high homocysteine on a lab. But what's interesting is, as it goes down that pathway, the next step in that pathway, it becomes cysteine and cysteine. Oddly enough, is an independent risk factor for obesity with no other comorbidities or no other um, implications on that pathway. So people that have elevated plasma cysteine have a higher risk of obesity and metabolic syndrome with that being the only marker. It's been clear in studies in rats. It's been clear in studies in humans. They actually did a study in Sweden, and I can't quote it completely, but they had 18,000 people that they segregated by genetics, and those with high cysteine actually had a higher risk of obesity. I see down the road that we'll use more genetics in our research, we'll use more genetics in the clinic, we'll be able to layer on top of that the um, pathway-specific metabolites and amino acids and be able to really see is that gene expressing itself and be able to optimize it very, very clearly. On the horizon, I think we're going to be able to find, using this particular pathway, and there's you know millions of other pathways in the body, how to better use nutrition starting from your diet and eating properly and you know feeding your gut biome, and then how to strategically use Nutri nutrition, and it may be supplementation, but it might be selectively choosing particular foods to better optimize our genetics.